Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. It is time for part four in this ongoing series of my Frost Grave Battle Boards. I don't know about you guys, but I'm about worn out on this project. Luckily, today's portion is totally different from everything else we've been doing. It's time to start doing the transition tiles and doing some snow transition, some hills. So no more resin, no more molding. Figured I'd need a little bit more room to work today, so I set up another table here so I can use this and my desk because I'm gonna have a whole bunch of these to make, and some of it's gonna get messy later on. I have a strip of the cobblestone that will butt up to the full tiles, and here I'm gonna put some foam and make a gradual hill out of styrofoam. I'm gonna put a bit of plaster on it and some snow flocking. The goal is to make it look like snowy wilderness transitioning into the frozen city. This is going to be a little bit tricky because I'm gonna have multiple tiles that are meant to work together, so I'm gonna to need to ensure that these hill transitions line up and butt together nicely. All these edges have to be nice and plumb and square. It's not just building one standalone piece, it's modular, so they have to work together, so that's gonna be a bit tricky, but I think I have a good plan for how I'm gonna do that. The first thing I need to do is build these up with styrofoam. Probably for the first time on this channel, I'm not gonna use XPS foam, I'm gonna use EPS foam, expanded polystyrene. That's the traditional styrofoam you see with all the little bubbles in it. It's cheaper and it doesn't matter in this case. I'm not slicing things up and doing fine detail. This is just a foundation that I'm gonna then cover with sculpt mold and probably some joint compound. It's, so it, it really doesn't matter. So I'm going with the cheaper stuff. All my adult life, I've driven a half ton truck. Worked construction, always drove a truck. So the idea of going and picking up materials was always very easy. People always ask, how do you get a sheet of foam home? And for me, I just always threw it in the back of my truck, but I always advised, if you just have a small vehicle, just cut it up in the store and throw it in your trunk, however it'll fit. Since leaving the construction industry, I realized I don't need a truck anymore, and my truck was getting super old, so I traded it in for a little crossover. And when I went to Home Depot to pick up the foam, that was the first time it was actually a problem for me. It was really annoying. I was gonna buy a big four by eight sheet of one and a half inch EPS and I'd have to cut it up in the store, but I didn't really want to do crappy cuts and screw up some of the edges because I had to do all these squares. And then I looked and to my surprise, they sold this. It's a handy pack. It's a bunch of strips of inch and a half foam uh, in a nice convenient size all bundled up together. And it did not really cost any more than the full sheet. Uh, it was, I did a quick math and it was basically the same price, so hell, this is perfect. They don't sell XPS like this, they, they should, but when you want the white EPS, handy pack, super great. So now I'm gonna start by attaching these somehow. To attach these, I'm gonna use the same PL Premium that I used to attach the resin. The reason for that is that it sets up really fast, it really holds and bites quickly, and it's safe to use on styrofoam. It says right there, adheres to foam insulation. I got this overhang that I can then cut off perfectly after, which I'll figure out how to do. I just got to do all of them now. When I cut up my MDF a few weeks ago there, I was smart and I actually made a whole bunch of blanks now I was able to make six tiles that are just foam, that are just gonna be snow tiles, and this will give me a lot more options for layout. Now I just need to cut off all of the excess, and this is a little bit easier said than done because it's very important that when I cut them, that it be a nice plumb cut. If there's any angle to it, it's gonna screw up how they butt up against each other. A knife is out of the question. There's no way to get that cut that good with a knife without 
making some sort of crazy jig. So I am gonna first try it on the Proxon. I did that previously on my other snowboards and hopefully that works. That was a success. All of my foam is cut and trued up and it worked really, really well because of a few things that I did. This is not a task that is dummy proof. You have to keep a few important things in mind when trying to make this sort of cut to make it work. I glued the foam to these boards and immediately moved on to doing this. With a lot of glue, you absolutely could not do that because as you're cutting, if the glue hasn't tacked up and isn't holding the foam perfectly in place, it will slide around and move a little bit and will really screw you up. So if you're using something like PVA glue, you're going to have to wait 24, maybe even 48 hours before you can do this. The PL premium that I used, it is super fast grabbing and I was able to do it immediately, which is one of the reasons that I was using a more expensive glue for this task. The next thing I know that everybody is wondering, well, at least some of you, as I was cutting these, I was using the MDF essentially as a guide so that the styrofoam gets cut flush. I had the MDF on the table, which in some cases made it difficult to see what I was doing. And I know a lot of you are wondering, well, why don't you just cut it this way so you can see what you're doing? Because that'll screw you right up, trust me. When you are making these cuts, you are putting pressure on the wire and using it as a guide. This is not a blade, it's, it's a wire, it has flex in it. So when you are pushing it to meet and ride that MDF, you're flexing this wire. If you put it with the MDF up, this is the hard point and it can cause flexing here, higher up which can cause this little bit of angle or wire to angle down to the hole that it's seated in and you can end up with out of plumb cuts, which is not what you want. This way, if you put the MDF down, you are putting the pressure point right next to the hole where it is holding the wire and you're far less likely to get any sort of flex. It's also really important to get your temperature right. You want your temperature set so that it is just barely hot enough to cut the foam because you wanna be able to go slow and steady and you don't want the heat from the wire if it's moving slowly to cause melting that causes this to go melted in further than the MDF. With XPS, this setting is a little bit higher because I'm using EPS here, this stuff cuts even easier. I actually started my first cut with the temperature on one, the lowest it would possibly go. It was a little bit too cool, so I turned it up to a two and that's what I set it at for this whole task. It was set at two, which is very, very low. Another thing you need to do is make sure that this wire is perfectly square to the table plumb and nice and tight. You don't want it so tight that it's gonna break, but you don't want a lot of slack. And when you're doing this many cuts, what can happen with this wire? As it heats up, it gets longer essentially and gets more flexible. So it's important that after several cuts, you actually turn off the machine for a few moments and let the wire cool and tighten up a bit. And you may even need to readjust this tension here because this, this is a little set screw, it can get loose over time. So throughout all the cuts, I adjusted it a few times, let it cool, took my time, low temperature, MDF flat on the table, and I am left with perfect pieces. I haven't actually butted them all up to each other, but I'm confident that they worked out good. Nice and square, nice and plumb. Booyakasha. And now we reach the next predicament. So these now butt together nicely and I have my snowy hill elevation, but I need to transition between this and this. And the idea is that I want to have a kind of sweeping gradual hill, like the landscape is going down towards the cobblestone streets. So I need to carve this transition and then later I'll put some sculpt mold on it to blend it down and that's not really an issue. The difficult thing is that 
This is not a self-contained piece. I have many of these and they need to butt together. So I need this transition, this curve, to be the same on all sides. It doesn't really matter what happens in the middle, but on all sides where they meet, they have to be the same in a line because I don't want it to look like this. I am thinking that the easiest way for me to accomplish this is to create a template or a bit of a jig as a guide that I can use on each one. And then I'll use that to cut. Still don't know if I'm gonna cut it with a knife or hot wire. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do this yet, but the first things first is a jig. All of my foam hills are roughly cut to shape now. The next phase is that I wanna cover these in sculpt and mold and or plaster and have that kind of transition down and fill in the rest. Right now, all of the styrofoam is cut in such a way that they align. But when I add the sculpt and mold, it's gonna add some amount of thickness to all of this. And that's gonna be really difficult to control that thickness and I could totally ruin all this effort I put into making this styrofoam align if the layers of sculpt mold don't line up. So I need a way that I can apply it that keeps everything the same and true. And as annoying as it's gonna be, I think the answer is to create a new jig, but one that's a little bit more complicated. I'm thinking a box that these sit in that has guide, on the sides a certain amount higher than the foam and I will be able to use this as a fill line so it's gonna take me a little bit of time to make that it's kind of annoying I hate making things to make things but that's what I got to do so I'm gonna do that problem almost good except somehow my bottom piece of foam I guess ended up a little bit too small so this doesn't want to fit in there nicely without screwing that up here and making it all cockeyed so guess I got to take this apart and make a new one jig 2.0 complete I took a lot more time used patience Spent about an hour getting this right, so everything was nice and true and flat and good. Now I just have to hope that my idea actually works, that this allows me to do what I think it's gonna allow me to do, and that it holds up doing a whole bunch of these. So let's uh, get set up to make some messy plaster.
Okay, it's been about 20 minutes since I put this sculpt mold on and it's already starting to be real dang hard. I love this stuff. It's actually really incredible how good it is because it dries so friggin' fast and it dries hard and it's easy to work with. I really like it. I know you can make your own homemade version, but honestly, the idea of making my own paper pulp, that's not a good time for me and it's not that expensive. However, to do the rest of this, I'm not gonna use sculpt mold I'm going to switch to uh, this. It's Quickset 30 or Proset 30 by this brand. It's drywall joint compound, but while normal joint, joint compound is like a gypsum plaster that dries through the water evaporating, Quickset has something else in it that makes it cure through a chemical reaction, making it dry very, very quickly. It's used in renovations to do your tape coat or bang on a lot of coats really fast or also to fill a gap because it unlike other joint compound it doesn't shrink so it's perfect for this application because i can use it makes it very thin the consistency of you know thin drywall joint compound and spread it over all the foam surfaces and it's going to kick it's going to set up really really fast so i'm going to mix up a batch of this nice and thin put these back in the molds and even out the tops of these. I'm also gonna coat the top surface of all of the plain, just styrofoam pieces, the ones that aren't transitions. Let's do that. Well, I got all the joint compound on. The form managed to hold up just enough to get it done, but she's done. She's going in the trash. It didn't work quite as well for the full pieces over there because this form is only, you know, half. Should have really made a full box one for those, but at this point, who cares? Very messy. There's just crap everywhere in the shop. This is just a whole friggin' gong show. Jeez, look at this. So I think I'm going to clean up and uh, let that stuff dry and come back to it in the morning. Anybody want some scraps? Good morning, folks. Well, it's morning for me. I have no idea what time of the day you're watching this video. New day, time to continue on this project. Two things I did before going to bed last night that I didn't actually film because it wasn't that interesting. I took some more of that Pro Set Quick Set drywall mud and I just did a quick little coating on all the styrofoam edges just to make it a little bit harder and smoother. I also took some of the leftover drying joint compound that I had left and I sculpted a few little snow drifts or wind drifts on the face of these hills just to make them a little bit more visually interesting. I did avoid doing any on the open flat areas and that's for good reason. I want these open flat areas and the full flat tiles to be completely playable. I don't want anything on them that will stop me from putting buildings wherever I want on the boards. But I figured on these hills, that's pretty safe. I'm not gonna be setting up any terrain on the, the hills. And also I think it might provide good place for minis to stop if they're sliding down the hill a little bit. So that's that. Now what I need to do, there's two more things I need to do before I can get to actually applying the snow onto these. One is I need to go through and clean up, you know, the little excess that's, you know, on the edges. And I'm gonna give all the sides a very quick sand. And then I'm gonna get some white paint and I'm gonna paint these edges. I don't need to paint this, the snow flock on this white joint compound, I think will be fine. But I wanna paint the edges to seal them and make them look nicer. And I gotta do that before I can put the snow down. So let's make a little bit more mess here. I 
I just want to point out that I did kind of a crap job on making the edges of these smooth. I used that quick set mud and the thing about it that I forgot to consider is that it doesn't sand very well. In construction you don't use it as a final coat, it's just a filler. So I really couldn't sand it smooth. They look really rough and kind of crappy. This is easily remedied by taking another thin coat of finishing compound, like normal joint compound, putting it over and smoothing it. And I absolutely could do that, but I'm not going to because time is running out for me on this project. I really wanna wrap these up this week, today, actually, hopefully. And if I put another coat of mud on it, that's just gonna stall the whole process. So I'm not gonna do that. It's not the end of the world. It's not perfect, but it's still fine and it's not gonna affect them in gameplay. One more thing I decided I wanted to do, however, before moving on to the snow flocking is dealing with this transition. Once I put the snow on here, it's probably hopefully gonna look great, but it's gonna be a hard transition between snow and the cobblestone. I remembered something that I had seen Mel the Terrain Tutor do years ago in one of his videos where he was doing a snow setup and that's going in with a white with an airbrush and kind of adding in a bit of haze past the point where the snow would be. This creates a kind of frosty effect and I wanna try that out. Hopefully it works. If it doesn't, uh, well, then I can just cover it in snow flocking. So I'm not gonna go all the way. I'm just gonna add a little bit of that haze and Hopefully it makes these look even colder. I'm really excited. It's finally time to finish these off with the snow effects. There's a lot of different ways you can do snow. One really kind of cheap, affordable way is to mix baking soda with PVA glue and spread that on top of your surface. The problem with that is that it will yellow over time and then it won't look like snow. It'll look like dog pee snow. You can circumvent this by adding some white paint into it. But honestly, I just bought some snow flocking. From everything I've seen, the nicest way to do this that is also easy is just to mix this snowflake stuff from Woodland Scenics with PVA glue and spread it over everything. It looks really great and it's not that expensive. One of these shakers does not cost that much. I did a few tests. I mixed up a slurry of PVA glue that was slightly watered down with the snow flock and I spread it on. It looked pretty good. Then I also tested out while it was still wet, sprinkling on some more of that snow flocking and it looked okay, it looked nice. But then I tried one more thing. I tried this snow flock from greenstuffworld.com. This stuff is a little bit different than the Woodland Scenic stuff. The Green Stuff World stuff has a bunch of very, very, very tiny glitter in it that gives it that sparkly shimmer that you get with real snow when it catches the light. I didn't want to use all of this to mix the paste. I, I just only have this little tub. I don't want the effect to be that strong. So what I ended up realizing from my tests is that if I made the main body with this, spread it over everything, and then just lightly sprinkled a little bit of this on top, it created the best result. So now I'm gonna mix up a batch and start coating these things. I'm gonna mix a little bit of water into my PVA glue. I only have a bit of PVA glue here. You don't want too much. You still want this to be fairly thick. We'll see if this lasts enough to do everything. I have no idea.
I learned a couple things doing this first one. This slurry mixture should be really wet. It was way too dry at first and I'm gonna mix in more water. It'll make it easier to spread and will make it look less grainy. The other thing is that it's actually kind of difficult to see where you've gone. So that's a little bit tricky, but overall I think it's going to work out well. I just hope I have enough glue to finish up so I don't have to trek out and buy more. Uh, so now I just got a whole bunch more to do. And uh, after I snap my fingers, the whole table will be done. We did it. Well, I did it, but you guys watched and I probably wouldn't have done this if you guys weren't watching. So we did it. My massive four week frost grave project is complete and just in time because tonight is our first scheduled game of frost grave on this table and it's been canceled because that is the life of a tabletop gamer. You make all this stuff and then your game gets canceled. Oh well, such is life. We'll reschedule and I'll just sit here and look at this. It is done. The snow is done. It is hard as a rock. If anyone was confused as to why I was mixing it with the PVA glue and spreading it and not putting PVA glue and sprinkling it, it's because I wanted it to be hard and durable. This stuff is not gonna flake off. It's basically like grout on this and it's amazing. I did end up having to go and get more glue to finish it and I used a lot more snow flocking than I had thought, but it's done. This is just one of the layouts. I can move them around, do other layouts. I actually have more of these field tiles. This isn't even the whole set. Yeah, let's talk about the elephant in the room, or at least what some of you are thinking about. How much did this project cost to make? Most of the things I build on this channel really only use a few dollars in materials. This took a little bit more. This was not a super cheap, thing to build. But I do think it was affordable considering the size. So I did some rough tallying of the costs involved in making this set. I just approximated and used <clears throat> guesses and rounding and I'm also using Canadian dollars. At the end I'll convert the total for you guys. These are also the prices that I paid for a lot of this stuff locally. Some of it could be cheaper online. There's so many variables, but kind of this is the approximate real world cost for me to build this. The silicone I used approximately, again, Canadian dollars, approximately $25 worth of silicone to make the two molds for this. The resin, uh, the amount I used, I calculated it was about $5 per 12 by 12 tile. And because I did 10 of these tiles, that's $50 in resin to make these. So that means that each one of these unmounted 12 by 12 tiles just on their own, just the resin and silicone was about 750 Canadian or about 570 USD per tile. There were some other materials involved in this obviously and I'm ignoring some of the little consumables that I just have on hand but the things that were really purchased and used just for this. So MDF I got three small sheets that was about $21. The PL premium is a fairly expensive glue. Two tubes of that cost me about 14 bucks. The styrofoam pack that I bought was about $22. The sculpta mold I only used a bit of a bag probably maybe five dollars worth. I'm not even gonna count the drywall compound because it was so little. PVA, I used a fair bit of Elmer's glue all, probably about $10 worth of PVA glue. And the snow flocking, I used one and a half shaker containers to do all of this. And that cost me 30 bucks because I bought it locally at a hobby store because I didn't want to wait to get it cheaper online. I used more than I needed to because I was doing a bit of trial and error on these. You could probably use it less. So all said and done, the dedicated materials that got used up on this build was about $177 Canadian. That's give or take-ish today's conversions, about $135 USD for this whole set. Worth it? I don't know. Everybody's gauge on cost is different. For me, I think it was worth it. This is a big set. It's made of resin. It's going to last a long time, and I'm planning on playing lots of games on it. I wouldn't spend that to make one prop for D&D that I used twice, but for a game that I'm hoping to play many, many games of for years to come, absolutely 135 bucks for the set. I think it's totally worth it. 
The other factor though that you gotta consider is time. This project took a lot of time and I tried to tally up about the hours spent making this set. It's a little bit difficult because I take much longer to do things because I'm filming and talking and setting up. And But if you were just building this or if I just built this without cameras involved, I estimate this project probably sunk in about 60 hours, six zero hours of labor onto this. So if you take the cost of the materials and then you take 60 hours of labor, I'm not gonna put a number on that because everyone values their own time differently. How much do you think an artist is worth? How much do you think a skilled craft person is worth? Times 60 hours, even at minimum wage here in Manitoba, which is like something like $12, uh, that's several hundred dollars in labor to build something like this. So there's a reason that if you're paying somebody to do this or buying stuff, buying resin pieces, there's a reason it's expensive. But me, it cost me about $177 Canadian and 60 hours of my time, which I think is time well spent because I think it was, I hope, I think, I think it was good content for you guys. And now I got a really cool board out of the deal. I hope you guys enjoyed this project and this series of videos. I'd really like to know what you guys thought of it because doing such a big project and spanning it over four episodes, did you like that? Was that cool? Let me know what you thought. It also, this project allowed me to change my format slightly and I approached it more in like a vlog style, just following my daily actions and building this rather than the kind of short form, snappy voiceover tutorial video. And I'd be really curious to know which what method of video you guys enjoyed more now having sat through all of this. Let me know what you think. If you like this video, hit that like button. Uh, if you didn't like it, hit the dislike button. I don't care. As far as YouTube's concerned, it's the same thing. So haters hit the dislike button. It helps. It's done guys. If you want to pick up any tools or supplies to do your own massive build or just some little small thing, head over to blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have my essential equipment store with links to all of the things that I use and recommend so you get the right stuff. And I earn through affiliate sales that helps fund builds and videos like this. There's some stuff on this project that's not in my essential equipment store. It's just specific to this project. So I will put links to those items in the video description. If you like these videos that I make every week, if they help you if you get a lot of value out of them. It'd be really nice if you considered supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. It's the support on Patreon that grants me the freedom to dedicate a bunch of time to crazy ideas like this and to document it and share it with you guys. I couldn't do it without Patreon. So if it helps you and you want to help me keep doing it, check it out. I would love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. That's it for this week. That's it for this build. I'll see you again next week. And uh, I don't know what I'm doing yet, but it's probably gonna be something simple and fun, I think. Cheers, guys. Thanks for watching.